Welcome to the third uh, Fluids and MHD seminar on this online format for this academic year. As this day, we've got Stéphane de Dizes uh, from Marseille. Uh, and Stéphane did his PhD in the early 1990s uh, in Ledix in Paris. Uh, then he had a, a short postdoctoral position at uh, UCLA um, before then moving to a CNRS position in, in Marseille, where he's been since then. And he's now director of the, the Institute. Um, and he'll be talking today about uh, internal shear layers in rotating and stratified uh, flows. All right, so so thank you very much, Adrian. And uh, so it's a pleasure for me to just uh, try to do this kind of Zoom seminar, the first time for me. I will try to, to see if it works. Or at least I moved to the lab to try to have a good connection. So Yafé, uh, it's a fluid mechanics lab, which is south of, Marseille, uh, south of France uh, in Marseille. Uh, we are doing both uh, experiments and uh, and uh, fundamental uh, theoretical studies. And today I'm going to, to talk about uh, internal shear layers in stratified and rotating fluid. So the topic mainly concerns this kind of uh, astrophysical and uh, geophysical objects such as planets and stars, where you may have rotation, which becomes important. And also uh, the ocean, where you have stratification, which is uh, an important uh, aspect of the fluid, or as well as the atmosphere. And what I will be discussed today is mainly on what kind of uh, response that you can have in this rotating and stratified fluid when you subject the fluid to uh, an harmonic forcing. And so, such an harmonic forcing, like you don't, uh, you have this kind of uh, due to gravity, gravitational forcing, and you you create typically uh, this kind of forcing when you when you for for planets and stars, and they can be decomposed in, in three types of categories. So we have the migration, which correspond to a, a fluctuation of the rotation rate of the planet of the star. You can have precession, which correspond to a, a rotation of the axis of rotation of the planet or star, and you can have, you have of course, tide, which is uh, create a elliptic deformation of the, of, the, of the fluid envelope. And all these effects are um, induced with periodic forcing. And uh, what I'm going to be look at in this talk is mainly something that occurs in, in the, within the fluid, which are the, this internal shear layer. So here I have just Give you two examples that you can find in the literature. It's, uh, in the case of the ocean, where you have a tide on the topography, and you create uh, in certain conditions uh, rays which are very localized, and this is kind of this kind of structure that I'm interested in. And you have the same uh, type of uh, behavior or feature of the fluid, where you have internal shear layers that develop also in rotating fluid. So this is a uh, Simulation by, by Adrian and his group. Uh, and the, for particular forcing, uh, this is the tidal forcing, is that it? But for particular frequency, you get the circuit which is closed and you get this uh, internal shear layers. And this is what I'm going to, to, to look at in this talk. And so I, I will part the, I mean, discuss this, this structure and I will also look at. What happened to this structure when they reflect on boundaries? And we know that for this example here, when you have a beam that interacts on the boundary, can, it reflects, but also it can generate a superb harmonic uh, contribution. So I, I will discuss this aspect for these internal shear layers. And it may also uh, create mean flow. And I will discuss this, this also. So mainly the outline, I will be, I mean, we mainly have three parts. Uh, one part, uh, we should give you some basic and large introduction on what kind of harmonic response you can expect in stratified and rotating fluid. And then I will move on the internal shear layer for its uh, general structure and how you can generate them by, uh, by libration. Then at the end, I will consider the reflection of such a layer on a boundary and all the nonlinear effects are you have in that case. So let's start from the basic. So the framework, I mean, uh, we are 
I, I use in all my talk and all my studies is, is just actually the, the basic uh, case where you have rotation and stratification. So I assume that you have a uniform and constant rotation of the fluid, which is defined by the angular rotation omega. And I assume also that I may have or not a stratification uh, along the same axis of rotation. And we define with a constant uh, uniform uh, buoyancy frequency that would characterize the stratification of the flow. I have diffusion effects to viscosity and the uh, 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 <coughs> diffusivity of the stratified agent. Imagine that you can have salt, salty water, for instance. And uh, in my work, I will use the frequency omega, which is the question to the frequency of the forcing that we use and its amplitude f. So if we look at the basic equation for, for the fluid that we consider, which are incompressible and Boussinesque, I have Boussinesque, I mean, this equation, so the navier stokes equation in rotating frame, where u is the velocity, p is the pressure, and B is a buoyancy of the fluid. So the fluctuation of, of uh, density with respect to the initial uh, density profile. So these equations uh, are nonlinear to this term, but if you look at harmonic solutions, you assume that uh, you have a small amplitude and uh, frequency omega, you end up with a linear system, which is this, this one equation and if you assume that the diffusion effects are small you end up with a system which is even smaller that can be reduced actually to a simple equation which is called the Poincaré equation for the pressure and this is uh, what governs the inertial gravity wave uh, in a stratified and rotating fluid and it gives you all the information of the wave of this of such a, of such a fluid and uh, actually, this equation has important properties. It's, uh, that it's actually an hyperbolic equation when the frequency is uh, between two omega and n, so the rotation, two times the rotation rate and the buoyancy frequency. Uh, and when this frequency is in so in this and in this range, uh, you expect to have uh, wave type behavior. But also, because it's a public, if you want to try to solve this equation in the in, in uh, limit domain, the bounded bound domain, you, you may expect to have also singularity because uh, you will not be able to impose boundary conditions in this domain from, from, from this equation because it's due to this public character. So, what can we say about the wave? So, if we look at an you know, open domain first, you can find the waves in the form of plane waves. And uh, as soon as you have, um, you can define this plane wave by your wave vector k. And it turns out that any plane waves of this form is solution of this uh, inertial gravity wave equation. As soon as you have this relation between the frequency and the wave vector, and it turns out that this equation can be written in a simpler way as a function just of the angle of the wave vector with respect to the, the vertical axis of the, the axis of rotation. So the dispersion relation of plane waves is a sample a expression that depends on just on the inclination of the, the wave vector. It's a relation between the frequency and the inclination of the wave vector. So when the fluid is only um, stratified, so no rotation, the, the this dispersion relation reduced to the this famous equation for internal wave gravity waves in the stratified media. And uh, the opposite, when you have no stratification, you are just rotating to get an equation for the inertial waves, the relation to the frequency and the inclination, the cost of the, of the angle of the inclination of the, of the wave. So these waves are plane waves. Can we put them in a finite volume uh, so that they can satisfy the boundary condition of the volume for, for example, uh, a stress-free or, 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 or a slip boundary condition uh, on, on the volume. Uh, but the problem is actually, it's actually that Gerard no, uh, except for two cases. Uh, the case where you have uh, 
cylinder or a sphere. So it's only for these two particular geometries that actually you can form modes and even show that you have a complete set of regular addition modes for these geometries. And uh, this makes these two particular symmetry very particular. And typically, a uh, kind of mode that you can form in, 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 a, in, in these geometries. Here is an illustration for a sphere. So, a mode, we call the Kelvin mode in that case, uh, of a rotating sphere, uh, where you have cellular pattern with particular radial and axial wave numbers. But in general, as, as soon as you consider different geometries on the cylinder and the sphere, you don't have regular DC modes, and only a very few of them uh, remain. So for a sphere, uh, you can try to see these modes and force them. This was first observed by Aldridge. Uh, for a sphere, when he looked at by liberation of the rotating sphere, he was able to excite this global mode of the sphere by uh, looking at the pressure on the axis. He observed and when he changed uh, the frequency of the liberation that could have a large peak for the pressure uh, response. And uh, it could attribute, attribute these, these peaks to, uh, to the presence of the mode and to direct forcing of the mode. So the first mode here was excited here for this particular frequency. Second mode corresponds to the second peak and so on. This was a way to direct force modes uh, of the sphere, but for particular frequency. For the cylinder, this was also done by McEvan in the 70s in this in this uh, apparatus by just moving uh, uh, the upper uh, boundary, tilting and rotating the upper boundary, was able to force particular frequency the mode of the cylinder. And here is typically an illustration of the sort of sinuous mode that is present in this case. So for the cylinder, for the sphere, you can have a direct forcing of mode, but you can have also something which is different in for this mode by another mechanism which corresponds to an instability. It is so called elliptic instability when you deform elliptically the, the, the streamline. So elliptic and deformation correspond actually to a tidal flow. So you have a, you impose an additional strain field, and by this uh, additional strain field, you 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 are able to couple the modes with each other, and uh, create an instability, a sort of triadic uh, resonance between these two modes and the elliptic deformation. And this was uh, observed and studied uh, experimentally by Christophe Eloy uh, with this apparatus, where you have a cylinder rotating around this axis and deformed by two rollers so that you impose elliptic deformation. And by changing the aspect ratio, it was able to, to observe different types of, uh, of modes corresponding to different types of resonance. So it was a way to create and uh, generate uh, instability and modes uh, in, this, in this cylinder. So you can do actually the same thing in a, in a sphere, which is elliptic deformed. It was carried out experimentally by Lacaz. And we have just an illustration of one of the modes that was uh, forced, which corresponds to the spinover mode, which is the central uh, rotation around the axis, which is perpendicular to the main axis of rotation of the field. So, this gives you some idea of what can we do in cylinder and sphere. So, you can form and excite global modes for the, for the geometry, but what happens now if we change and use a different geometry? So this comes, we are seeing becomes more complicated that because so we can go back to the equation and try to look at the, what we can get from, from, from the equation and what we do for the hyperbolic equation. Typically we look at the characteristic line and try to look uh, if you have a localized perturbation where this perturbation will, will propagate in the field. So if we have an oscillation, localized oscillation, uh, the, the characteristic line in that case uh, will are cones. So it means that the, the perturbation will propagate along uh, a particular direction if R have an angle theta with respect to the to the horizontal axis. That by 
and this theta actually and this is interrelated by the to this equation. I don't know if it's exactly the same equation that we have for the for the plane wave equation for the wave length vector where theta was the angle with respect to the vertical axis in that case. So the propagation is is uh, along a direction which is uh, theta with respect to the horizontal uh, plane for this case. So if we have a finite domain, you can try to look at what this uh, characteristic will go and reflect on, on boundaries with the same angle. And uh, if you have an axis, if you have an axisymmetric domain or two D domain, you can imagine that you can look at the trajectory in the cross section and try to study whether you obtain periodic orbits, quasi periodic orbits, or, or other attractors uh, pattern. And among the questions that you can have for this case is actually can we connect uh, the presence of modes with with a, to the pattern that you get from the characteristic lines? These are among the questions that are open, uh, remain open. And can we have always uh, um, a link between the, the pattern, which have to be maybe ergodic or fill the, the domain to, to obtain a regular mode? Or do we have something more singular? Uh, I assume when you have attractors, these are the kind of questions that we can answer uh, for 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 this um, for this system when the, you are not in a cylinder or in, or in a sphere. And uh, here, typically, what an exercise that we can carry out for for this geometry uh, with particular geometry, which is the uh, configuration of a cylinder with a section of the cone inside the cylinder. So we are not in the perfect uh, cylinder geometry. So we do not expect to have a uh, uh, regular mode, a complete set of regular modes. And if we try to, to look at the rays and the, and the, and the, and the response that you, the free uh, create when you have uh, Vibration in this in geometry, and it's what you typically what you get. The two examples. So, liberation of this geometry at the frequency omega, if a large omega at 0.47, so which is just rotating case here. Um, you can have typically an attractor for this frequency, which is visualized here. So all the lines are colliding on this picture. And we do observe when you do the simulation of this situation, a pattern where you see the trace of this, uh, of this attractor. But uh, this is not always the case. You may have a weak attractor or something, a picture which have particular structure which is visible when, in the, when you plot the rays. And when you look at the pattern of the velocity, you may have more uh, structured look like the mode uh for for this geometry so the relation between rays and and and, and, and mode pattern is and all i mean the response is uh there are some indications that can have relation but it's not a one-to-one -one relation it's not easy to solve and there are no general results for for any object uh, for, for whatever the geometry actually so the attractors uh, have been, I mean, the subject of many uh, work. And uh, for the rotating shell geometry, there are many papers about the Piotr and his group, where they try to look at the relation between the modes that you have in a, in a shell, a rotating shell, uh, when you add some viscous, viscous effect, weak viscous effect, and the, the structure of the attractor. And uh, what he obtained for that he do observe some modes that are related to, to the attractor pattern and the mode tends to lo be localized where you have the attractor. But uh, whether how is it always the case? Uh, is it the one-to-one -one relation? This is not clear uh, for, for, for even for the, for the shell geometry. So attractors are also present in, in a stratified free. So we, here is an experiment which has been done called the group of mass, where you have a tank 
is the trapezoidal form where you have attractors uh, so that, which are present in these geometries. And I've been able to observe them experimentally uh, by shaking the box in that case. And you can observe them also numerically by moving the, this, this boundary, I guess, in this case. So attractors are present and they correspond to response of the fluid. And uh, for in the MVC limit, I mean, they correspond to singular uh, solution. But as soon as you put some viscous effect, you expect to have uh, well-defined structure in the particle width as observed in the numerics and the experiments. So singularities are also present uh, in the fluid uh, when they are come from the source, directly from the source. They will propagate in the fluid as, as the wave, I mean, along these characteristic cones. And so here are two examples where you see this kind of propagation of singularities associated with uh, the boundary. In the case of very abrupt topography in the tidal flow in the, when the in configuration where you have stratified here, and you have a tidal flow, so insulation of the, of the flow around this kind of needle. And so, so the peak here creates a, a singularity that propagates oh, sorry, within the fluid. Uh, and we can see this trace here. So this is the, the propagation of the peak of the, I mean, the, the edge of the topography. And the same here in the illustration for relative fluid uh, by the same experiment by McEvan that we had before, where we see the trace of the corner within the tree, which is transmitted within the tree along this characteristic line. So we see in that case the trace traits that, uh, that come from the, the discontinuous behavior that you have at the boundary. So the last source of, of discontinuity or singularity that you can actually have uh, in this uh, certified and rotating fluid in the MVC limit are two other type of singularity, which we call critical latitude singularity. So for convex boundary, this can be understood uh, quite easily. Imagine that you have a, a localized object like a sphere or cylinder, which is uh, oscillating. We expect it to generate waves that will propagate at least a given angle, theta. So if you have a, a limit domain, you expect to have a wave propagating only in the in the blue regions here and regions where you have no wave. And the same in this region, the dark blue is you have a double propagation, so coming wave come, will be coming from an emission from here and here will give you something in this region. So you see that typically you have uh, regions that limit regions between waves and non waves. So it is, is expect to, to provide a, a, disc, a singularity, a discontinuous behavior. Um, and this is kind of singularity line, which are associated to uh, what we call the critical latitude, because it corresponds to the line which is tangent to the to the object. So the direction of propagation is tangent to, to the source. And for the sphere and the uh, cylinder, it, it, it corresponds to particular latitude, which is related to the direction of propagation, which is uh, defined by this, this expression. So in that case, the critical latitude is related also to the frequency. And you expect to have uh, the lines that, that leave from this latitude. If you have a singular, you expect to have a singularity leaving from, from, from on this line. And when you have viscous effects, you will have to can expect to smooth this singularity and this is to give you the internal shearing of the Discuss after all. So these lines are being observed experimentally and numerically. So this is an example of, of the group of Sweeney and uh, gravity wave where you oscillate a small cylinder in a stratified field. And they do observe um, the pattern that I've plotted here that is emitted from this critical latitude and propagating the field. And so the last kind of instability that we can form come from the outer boundary, 
Well, since it's a different kind of singularity that propagates uh, within the tree, it's associated with the uh, variation of the viscous boundary. Here. So this kind of singularities that are generated when you oscillate the boundary, outer boundary, imagine that you uh, do a vibration of this boundary. You have an, a stock layer, which has a particular width, which is given by this relation width. So it's be the, the maximum value of this, this quantity. And the, this width uh, actually blow up for particular latitude. So it's this width depends on the, on the inclination of the, of the boundary. And for particular inclination, you have uh, a blow up of the boundary layer. That means that the, the boundary layer change of scale. And view from the bulk, this forcing means that you have a kind of singularity at this point because there's a boundary layer change of, of, uh, of, of width. And this singularity will propagate also uh, within the three. And uh, this is what has been observed when you look at the precession motion of, uh, of a sphere for low command number. You get structure, in particular, the radial velocities that are visible within the sphere. That are associated with this uh, instability. I mean, this not um, with this uh, singularity of the boundary layer. And this, uh, so you have something leading from this particular attitude, which is 30 degrees, for this frequency, which is quite close to omega, or large omega, yeah, so it's at 30 degrees for non stratified field. So you have a, a, a wave emitted from, from this point. That go to the south pole, and you have the symmetry that go to the north pole. So this is typically the structure that are generated, and the limit uh, of small Ekman number become big, smaller and smaller in, the, in this limit. So this gives you a sort of panorama of this kind of behavior that we have for for in this rotating as such like in the in a finite domain or an open domain. And here I'll just summarize or just say. So typically, what as soon as you have put some viscous effect or I mean, diffusion effects, there is a problem can be solved. I mean, you have an electric problem and well posed, and you can find actually a response, um, whatever the domain. And uh, but the question is, what happens when the viscosity goes to zero? Do you get something singular in the domain or not? Or is it related or, or can be related to the non viscous problem? So when the frequency is not in the inertia gravity frequency range, uh, the, you have no problem because uh, actually the, the non viscous problem can be solved and you have a regular problem and actually you can find the solution in this limit and you have no singularity uh, when the forcing is come from the boundary, whatever the, the structure of the domain or an open domain or a spherical shell. Problems come when you are just in this range of the frequency. So in the inertia gravity uh, frequency range. And depending on the geometry, you have or for the sphere and, and the cylinder, so you have regular this mode, so we have no problem to decompose the, the forcing of this mode and the solution. So you may have some trick try to find the resonance, and, the, and you may have weak singularity that come from the corner of the, of the critical latitude of the outer boundary. So when it's green, it may be you have many, 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 so when it's uh, orange, you have just uh, good understanding of the only partial result. But when you go to the spherical shell or to other domains, so the, you still have a missing mode, which are present, but most of them are not present, and you have other modes, and it's not clear so far how, how these modes uh, or they are related to attractor or critical latitude singularity. We have some correspondence, but it's the, there are no general uh, theory for that. And even less things are known concerning whether this mode will be able to resonate or not and uh, what what will be the, the frequency response or the amplitude when they are from, from globally from, from, from the 
from the boundary. And uh, we have very few information also for this uh, domain concerning the critical critical latitude singularity from the, uh, all the, for their structure. We have only some partial results for, for the, all the singularity associated with that factor is, is smooth by the positive for particular situation for the in mainly in 2D. When the domain is open, the problem is simpler because you don't have attractors, you don't have mode, and you don't have resonance of mode. You just have can have singularities that are associated with uh, the, the critical latitude. And uh, this is actually what I'm, I'm going to, to discuss now in the rest of my talk. It's mainly the singularity generated by uh, an object which is oscillating um, in an open domain. So we don't have to, to look at the attraction and the structure that is generated. So let's move a little bit for on uh, this internal shear layer. And I will need to present you some first some old results that was been obtained for for rotating flows in the, in the boundary geometry. And uh, in the 50s and 60s, or even before Coleman was in the 20s, uh, people were trying to address it. This problem where you rotate uh, a, a disk at different speeds than the, the, the fluid at a different rotation. And what they observe that you have sort of fluid, which is a column, which so is a steady motion in that case. And this motion, where you have the continuity, is typically what the equivalent of what our layers, because we are steady, the propagation when you are steady and non stratified corresponds to vertical propagation. So imagine that this is correspond to the propagation. Uh, so the gravity rates are actually vertical in that case. So what you expect is these regions are the singular region that we are addressing, talking about in the previous year. And so smoothing of this uh, singular region by viscosity will create this layer, this international layer I'm interested in. In turn out that when you are in a boundary geometry like this one, so boundary between two disks or boundary between two spheres, the structure that you get for this internal shear layer is, is quite complex. It's what we call the Stewartson layers. So for two disks, we have uh, one third and one fourth layers, which are nested around this, this, this singular form. And for this uh, situation, it's even more complex. Why you have three kind of layers, one third, two sevenths, and one, one fourth. So it, it's a complex multi-layer structure for, for when you are in a boundary geometry. And uh, it turns out that for when you move to a different situation where you are open, like uh, just to press one of the of the plan, so look at just the rotating disk, same same rotating disk. With a slightly different rotation, you, you have also formation of uh, what is called now a, a Taylor Pullman column. And the boundary of the Taylor column Pullman is, is, uh, is a singular internal shear layer that I'm looking at. And when you are open, this, this layer is it's simpler actually. And it's just have a scaling, which is equal one third. So it's a single layer structure. And uh, it, it's why. It's Actually, what I'm going to show you for, for in general case, when you are oscillating, it's actually simpler for this case, when you are open. And it turns out that this layer also have a self-similar solution. And then we can try to we'll see that we are going to, to be able to use the solution that was introduced for this case. Uh, I mean, more than almost I mean, 50 years ago. Uh, for this kind of problem, for, for, the, for the problem I'm going to, for the periodic case. So the problem that was I'm going to look at is mainly this case, the rising disk. And for this rising this problem, the self-similar structure of this internal shell was provided by Mu and Sachman 
in the 79, 69. He introduced this uh, family of function that depend on the single parameter M uh, and which characterize uh, propagation along this trace of uh, singularity that was created here and the nature of this, uh, the, the singularity is in this question to the part and when this this data goes to, to, to infinity it goes from, from this infinity or, or set similar variable it goes to infinity z is equal to zero so when you get close to the source you have behavior which is this could be eight as r minus a as a power minus n. So it gives you the nature of the singularity at the, at the source here. So Mo and Safman show that this equation, we define the equation number like that. This uh, solution here as a function of this uh, variable, the set similar variable. Is uh, an approximate solution if the Ekman number was to as Ekman number was to zero, and it gives you a, a solution that where you have uh, an increase of the width of this uh, internal shell here, but as a power as a, with a function of z as a distance to the source, as z as a power one third, and with a, a, a with a dependence with Ekman number as a, as a power one third. And uh, what is uh, interesting is that this solution, yes, is valid uh, at the distance uh, of order one from the source. And what uh, Mo and Safman show that for this case, for the rising disk, you know, in this, he obtains uh, the value of m, the value of the amplitude of this solution, which is mainly uh, an actual solution and rotating solution in this in this region, which is much stronger than what you have outside. And you see that you have an one sticks V in this region. So the, the, the structure that you have uh, in this uh, self similar region is much stronger than the displacement of, of, of the of rising disk. Yeah, really a, a behavior which corresponds to a singular behavior. And it's typically what we have uh, kind of thing we want to, 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 to see. And this function is can be plotted and Compute it and give you know, the real part of IH for the value one half and the imaginary part. So you have a smoothing, the singularity uh, of, the, of this uh, of the peak that we explore all the way when the when, with the man, when, uh, when you get close to the to the source. So this solution is what introduced for the case where you have no frequency and no certification actually uh, exist when you have both uh, an oscillation and certification and here what you get in that case so the same function hm already uh, which is defined by this behavior of infinity so the nature of the singularity you can find a set similar variable, which depends on this variable along the direction of propagation and the normal to it. And you have a scale uh, LD X parallel one at the power one third. So you get uh, an increase of the, the width of this, uh, of the, this, uh, this race, this internal shear layer. And uh, you have this, the main behavior is along this uh, axis. And we have the same azimuthal direction here. We have the same order uh, behavior. And when you are stratified, you have also a variation of buoyancy with the same order. What is uh, smaller is actually the normal velocity to the side. So the question was is this problem is what is actually the general, what is the trend to the singularity, and what is the amplitude of the solution when you have uh, you try to oscillate this kind of uh, uh, of object. So we have so we can redefine and spur if we are normalize this by the define an Ekman number with the correct frequency and a, and a scale. 
you can write it this way, where you have the Lekman number one flow that appears and the dependency with respect to the distance to the source. And the coefficient here is it's a function just of the frequency, the angle of propagation, and uh, omega, and also if you have diffusion inputs on the stratification of the quantum number. So this is a correlation of the problem when the man goes to zero and it's the leading order approximation, we have correction from the zero of the Lichtman one. So we have tried to implement this solution and try to see whether we can describe this flow generated by uh, two solutions, which are uh, the case where you have a vibration of the uh, object, which is a, a sphere or, or disk. And so we consider uh, uh, these two cases. So we assume that the rotation of the, field, the volume and assume that the sphere or the disk is slightly uh, have an additional movement, which is defined by an amplitude epsilon and its frequency omega. So this is typically a case of the vibration in the open domain. And uh, here are what we can do the simulation of this problem. Uh, here what you, you observe for uh, spheroid and for this, for the same parameter, same amplitude, epsilon, same frequency of oscillation and for a given Ekman number. For a case where you are just uh, rotating, so no stratification. So we stop at a given stance here. We see that actually now this structure is very similar, even for, for thermal form and the we may imagine that if, if I try to stop at the same instant, we are typically the same kind of structure. And it, it looks like the same, actually, when we are visiting this kind of spheroid. But we actually, what we observe is that we don't have, we do not have the same for both cases. And because if we look at the scaling that we have in terms of Beckman number, what we observe is that we observe uh, something different for the spheroid and for the disk. For the disk, uh, so we have vibrations, so we have create um, stock layers that will have a effect. So you, you expect to uh, induce, I mean, a flow is in the domain of the power one half, so it's a small domain, and you have a singularity that generates a ray at the power of Ekman one fix. Because you are, you are in, a, in a cylindrical geometry that you are propagating on cones, you have sort of focusing effect. So it's why you have a larger response on the axis when you, you reflect and you continue propagating. Turns out that when you do the same for the spheroid, you get a, a larger uh, array, which is Ekman 112, and uh, so a larger uh, also value on, on, on the colleague. On the point where you collect when you collide with the axis. So, how it, why do you obtain this and how you can prove that? And the way we, we did it is, uh, is the following I just give you an idea of the proof and uh, how you can actually show that the command one self uh, entropically. And the way you do it is actually you look at the solution in the boundary layer. And try to match with a, a solution, uh, the solution that I presented to you, to you, which is the internal shear layer solution, the self similar solution, without prescribing the, the, the amplitude and the, and the strength of the solution. And when you try to, to look at the matching of these two kinds of solution in a region, when you get close to the singular point, that's the critical latitude position. We do have normal velocity on the boundary layer that blow up. And we do have also a blow up of the solution when it gets in this solution. And the matching of both is possible only for particular values of M and C0. So it appears that this uh, condition and the scaling for the, for the amplitude of the internal shear layer. Uh, amplitude at, at the power Ekman 112 comes from compatibility, compatibility condition between the boundary layer and the internal layer uh, solution. So 
So we have checked the matrix is KU and this amplitude. We have no parameter here. What I should say also maybe on this relation is that you, have, you see that we have a kappa C here. Kappa C is the, the local curvature uh, at, the, at the critical point. So it tells you that the flatter you are, the, the stronger you will have uh, as an amplitude. And if you have a peak, you have a capacity that go to infinity. You so you expect uh, in that case to have uh, a small uh, amplitude. So that's why maybe for the disk you get a smaller amplitude because you have a peak. You are not flat anymore, close to the critical latitude. So we have checked this numerically, this scaling, and it works quite well. Just to say, what <laughs> you can do the same for the disk by a different method, but we have also shown that for the disk, we have a self-similar solution with the index M for the, typically, that corresponds to Dirac singularity from the edge and an amplitude that you can compute. And this gives you the, explains the difference that we obtained from, from the scale. But if we look at the form of the solution, self-similar solution, and the, they are actually very similar for H1 and one 5 forms. So the main difference comes from the, the difference of, of scaling that. So just to finish this part and just say that my point was for, for the harmonic response. Uh, sorry. For the what I showed that when you look at the liberation from an, an object, uh, which is that which is uh, asymmetric, you expect to have a wave. Which is dominated by internal shear layers that can be described by this self similar solution, which are just have an universal structure. And we, if you have complex structure, we can expect that you have from a few points out with corresponding to critical latitude or boundary singularity, you may want to describe the feature, I mean, the main feature of the curve. Remain to be done is whether you can do the same procedure for, for any kind of oscillation. In all operating domains, this, this has, I mean, the extension that we need to look at, we need, we need to, to, I mean, to look at now. And so, all uh, the extension is clearly what, what we need to do is now to close uh, this, this internal shear layer circuit. So, when they get closed, do we have the same structure which is emitted from this point when your, your split circuit uh, get, get back? Uh, like like in the situation where you have a particular frequency when the, the emission uh, which is generated from, from the signal boundary is go back to the to the senior source so, so this is the first step I think we need to go to through this situation and then to look at also more complex situation where you have attractors so Gilby provided some information concerning the case in 2D and show that this internal shear layer structure and this solution by Moore and Safran also seem to, to describe the, the, the attractor structure. The things to be done, I mean, for, for in a more general set that in particular for in the 3D for, for, or for when you have an axis, reflection of the axis which become complicated things. So I don't know, I think I, I spoke too much. And I, I'm going to, to give you just a, in a rapid five minutes that are left, some information concerning the reflection of, the, uh, of such internal shear layers and boundaries. So this is important to study this because as soon as we have a, a, a ray that is generated by the topography, it may reflect on other places. And so the question of whether or will Will you have something different occurring in this region? What will appear here? And the same for, for the rotating shell. You may have this internal shear layer that will, may reflect on the outer boundary. And this region where you have the reflection is, is maybe of interest. And my question was if you have this internal shear layer with a particular skin in Ekman that get collide and uh, reflected by a boundary, what can we say concerning this reflection? And it's a nonlinear effect that are generated. So concerning the reflection, things are classical. So you expect to have a contraction or, or 
expansion of the of the of the of the wave b when you are an effect group, which depends on the factor k, yeah, which depends on the angle of propagation of the rays and the angle of the inclination of the, of the boundary. And uh, and what we observe is actually if you have a set similar structure, when you get to the point of reflection, you, you you still have a self similar structure for the reflective beam. This is indicated here. So if you have an epsilon and amplitude with a beam with a given M, you end up for the reflective beam, the same structure, except that you have this factor K plus corrections that are associated with the viscous effects. And this viscous effect creates. Um, uh, a correction which has also a set similar form but with a different uh, index. And this correction is the Ekman 1 fix. We'll see the importance of this in a few transparency. And if we look at this beam, it out that if we look at the nonlinear effects, so within the beam, the, the Reynolds thread suggests the square root of the, uh, of the, the amplitude. But when we get close to the boundaries, so this the incident beam can reflect, I mean, interact with the reflective beam. So this would increase the renal stress, and you have much larger renal state close to the boundary where these two, uh, two beams interact. So in this region, you may have, uh, I mean, a strong source of nonlinearities and strong mean flow. So you have to, I mean, the mean you will expect to have a strong mean flow and a strong second harmonic generated by this nonlinear interaction. And uh, if we look at just from the second harmonic, here is what we observe. Depending on whether the, the frequency of the two omega is within the inertial frequency, uh, inertial uh, gravity frequency range, we have on a, a, a beam that is created. And this mechanism is actually similar to the interaction of two beams uh, uh, in that case. So this phenomenon is purely in this scene. And, but when we look at the mean flow, we have what we have, two cases. So when we are, when you are both stratified and rotating, the frequency omega is automatically outside the, the inertial gravity uh, frequency range. So you don't expect to have possibility of uh, emitted wave at this frequency. So do you have localized solution in the region where you have the interaction of the incident and reflective beam. But as soon as you have uh, no stratification or no rotation, things become different. For instance, for the case where you have no stratification, you pop can propagate Taylor columns, and you observe that uh, you have a possibility of having uh, a mean flow far from the region where you have this uh, strong interaction. The scaling is slightly smaller than the inter interaction zone, but it's still larger than one. So, like Ekman minus one six in this region. And you have a similar phenomenon for, for non rotating but stratified feet, where you create a horizontal sheet uh, that are developed far away from the interaction zone. So, these effects are, are due to viscosity. If you don't put the viscosity on the boundary, you don't have this this uh, new uh, mean flow it's really uh, important it's actually created by the the correction the viscous correction that i of the the reflective beam the ekman one fix correction to the reflective beam that is responsible for this uh, this mean flow here so to conclude that because the the incident beam is actually uh, is quite universal we can expect to have also, uh, nonlinear structure, nonlinear correction, which have, have uh, also an universal structure that mainly depend on the this uh, index m. So this nature of the uh, of the singularity that gives rise to this uh, internal shear here. And what we have shown that is actually that the interaction of this the incident and the reflecting beam keep the same similar self similar structure is responsible for a double harmonic beam. If the price of frequency is within the, the inertial gravity range, frequency, frequency range, or only to a localized mean flow correction of the same order, 
that when you are non stratified or non rotating, you have an additional mean flow correction. And all this uh, can be computed in general. I mean, this is also universal. And uh, this is the main feature of this, uh, this effect. And uh, I guess I have used my time, and it's time to close this lecture. And uh, so I thank you very much for your attention. Just to mention that the main result of this, what I've just proposed today is. I've been published in GFM.